Good morning, Collingswood. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Great to be here. Uh, can everyone in the back room hear me fine if I speak at this level? Okay. We're videotaping, so I'm going to try to pay attention to where I stand, but I want to make sure everyone can hear me. Uh, okay. How many people uh, live in the community? Can you raise your hands just so I can see how many? Okay. And how many have to travel more than 20 minutes to get here? I'm very impressed. So. Uh, all solutions have to be regional. We can't just solve a problem in one community and feel like we've really addressed the issue. I'd like to start with a, a concept that this gentleman standing here, as I think anyone would, perceives a community to be about people. That the community uh, allows us to raise our families in a safe environment, uh, maximize the social exchange, uh, creates the right opportunities for children, retail life, all the reasons why cities exist. But the reality has become something different. Uh, the man is actually standing in a make-believe world, Disney World, and the world doesn't look like that anymore in most places. And so we see endless streams of traffic, parents rushing their children across the street, and as I did, uh, down on here in Ontario. Here in Ontario? Here in Ontario. Here, yeah. <laughs> Motors wouldn't yield to me on the principal main street. And uh, so this is, this is just symptomatic of uh, what we see in our own communities of what we're now seeing throughout all of North America. Uh, the uh, areas we look at are, are a, a mess and it's not a very good place to live in place. Uh, Robert, can we lower the screen anymore? We'll come down. We're losing a little bit of the imaging. My understanding is uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So I, I let's start with the whole concept that you're not in this alone. And also, as we look out on any street, we can imagine it being better. And all streets which originally were just carved out for one function only to speed up traffic, make traffic efficient, are now meant to become streets that add value to every property. And if there's ever a design that doesn't add value to adjacent properties, it's the wrong design. And if it doesn't enliven and enrich lives, it's the wrong design. From here on out, we have to be incredibly incredibly strategic on which roads get the first amount of money so that we can rebuild our economy. It won't be which one's having the most problems with traffic. That's stupid. Because as we've learned, each time we add to the carrying capacity of a road, we further eroded the capabilities of our towns to be livable, walkable, lovable places of pride. So that's, in sum, the essence of my ma uh, message. And we don't have to have too much imagination to realize that when the engineers were tasked, and this is what they were tasked to do, is to get everybody home to the suburbs as fast as you could, they didn't intend that they would take one human life every year within range of this camera, and yet they did. And it's been 40 years, and it has not changed. Somewhere, we have to wake up and realize that if our, we only have one goal to be efficient, then we're going to fail on all of the other needs of a community. And so as we go forward, we need to uh, study Vancouver. This is West Broadway. That used to be a, uh, uh, a strip. It really was. But today, it's the social fabric of the neighborhood. It has added value to homes a quarter mile deep on both sides of immense value. One road rebuilt will rebuild an entire neighborhood. So we think about what they did with West Broadway, and then we think of what to do here on Ontario, or Hume, or any street. And if we fall below that line, we're missing the point. Streets are for people, and if we want active, lively, lively places, then we need to uh, build appropriately. So this is just an example of an intermodal center in a British Columbia town. 
And uh, before I got there, I said, oh, I need a town of a similar population, show what an intermodal center should be, and was able to drop Boulder, Colorado's uh, intermodal building on top of that building, and that's truly what we should think about that if we build the good streets, then the good buildings will come and greet the streets, but we have to have good streets if that's going to work. I'd like to start with the human health issue since this is such an important part of our future economy, that by not attack, attacking head on the issues of active transportation, we've ended up with some health issues that are very <laughs> alarming. <laughs> and we did this to ourselves. This was not planned, but it's an outcome of only thinking one way. Now things have also gotten more complex. We now have computers, which is a boom to communication. But it's robbed us of active living. We need to also understand uh, that uh, active living and active play have to be natural. We have to make walking natural again, but we have to make play an unplanned activity. It has to be spontaneous and it has to be available in each neighborhood and in front of each home. So I like to think of the breadth of what we're trying to achieve from those who are the most young and need uh, adults to watch over their lives in their early years to give them guidance to those folks who just need someone to be able to visit with and a format or stage where that happens naturally, and that's what a good street does. I also want to focus on the fact that when we lose our mark, as Cheryl discovered when I was doing a uh, workshop in uh, Alberta, uh, she came to realize she bought into a neighborhood where she can't find volunteers. If we have problems with the design of our communities, it affects everything we do, including having a purpose in life. And we've got to get that back and make sure we never see this uh, in Ontario. This is in Portland, and it's a very sad uh, feeling to think that my mom could be out there begging for food because we've forgotten how to build a city that's inclusive, that watches over everyone's needs. So I'm going to focus on a couple of remakes. Uh, this one hasn't been built yet, but it's been envisioned. Uh, in this case, uh, it's uh, West Lafayette, home of Purdue. Any graduates of Purdue? <laughs> Anyone here ever hear of Purdue? <laughs> OK. Uh, well, what's missing? What's missing? People. People. And how do you get people? Trees. Trees. Make it safe. Make it safe and take away two of the stupidest lanes that ever could have been there. A main street is for access, and as long as it's a one-way, you only need one lane. You cannot feed more traffic into that upcoming intersection than what one lane will supply. And so by doing this, we now have the money now to fix 10 streets. And uh, so I'm now doing a lot of work. I'm on an open-ended master services agreement with the, in the U.S., the AARP retired people, largest volunteer organization in the world, and uh, working about 20 cities a year for them. And so this is a, a, an area hard hit by three hurricanes uh, in a row, and then the oil spill. Uh, this is Gulf Shores and Orange Beach, Alabama. Very conservative territory, very fundamentalist. So I got there, and when we finally uh, got to this road, a three-lane road, could look like Hume might be in one of its future innovations. Uh, I said, well, this is the natural place for your village. This is where your life needs to come together. And that evening when I presented this, in the front row was the traffic engineer with tears in her eyes. And she came up to me afterward and said, Dan, we're at 90% plans completion, and that road will look like this. <laughs> And she said, is there any way we can stop it? And I said, you're the traffic engineer at 90% plans completion. You haven't started mixing the asphalt or the concrete yet, so it's up to you. But to do it, she had to have both communities work together. 
And so what we were able to do, within two months, come up with a concept that would move the traffic better, safer, and mean that people wouldn't drive as far. And that's what Hume Road will want. Did I pronounce it correct? Somewhat. Okay. Um, and they're doing it because the right people came together. And, uh, but they still have the need for spare lanes for, for emergency evacuation. And so we looked at this area, it's a 12 square mile area of preserve, and they want a bike trail. So I said, okay, we can give you the bike trail, that's easy enough to do, but we're gonna make it a little wider than we ordinarily would. It's gonna be 14 feet wide, and the bridges and everything are going to be built structurally for the evacuation. And during evacuation day, when we have to get those extra vehicles out, the FEMA monies will pay for this trail. We just need to be smarter. Don't build big, build sensibly. And uh, later I was able to go to uh, Mountain Bio, which is um, uh, the only 100% African-American community, I think, in North America. And uh, the, the people who settled here were going to escape a plantation before the Civil War. After the Civil War, they, they were released, and they went and founded their own city. And then they realized no one would give them health care. No one. And so they built their own hospital with their own hands. And then they realized that they needed insurance. So they founded their own insurance company because no one would sell them insurance. And that's the innovation of these people. But this is what their town has become. Even the new health department was put way outside of their town where they don't have access to their health care. So we work with them, again, a project for AARP. And this is what the community will, will become because they are willing to work together for their own health and for their own economy. So let me introduce you to a, a project in Chico, California. This is a three-lane road that has to carry 18,000 vehicles a day. Now that's not hard for three lanes. Uh, and Hume, I think we learned, is carrying 12,000 to give you a comparison. So we said, well, yeah, we, we do need the third lane but we also need something that's going to bring prosperity to this entire corridor. And so this is what we came up with. And this is, uh, in general, at least in principle, what you really should do when you revisit the design of Hume. Uh, notice the third lane is Colorado, so no one even begins to think that that's really a passing lane. And then we put in the crossing islands to absolutely prevent anyone from using it as a passing lane. And now we have access and so on. We have trees and planter strips. And uh, now the investor, the developer, can come in and build beautiful buildings that front the street, provide the security, and so on. So the question comes up, with Hume, you have 66 feet. That's a lot of right-of-way. We were told you didn't have enough right-of-way for bike lanes. We did this in 60 feet. All of this. So think strategically in the future. Don't think of the car first. Don't forget the car. You'll be in real problems if you do. But think of working from the edges first. Whatever's left over can be in the center. And in this case, with 60 feet, you have six more feet to spare. That you could do a wider sidewalk, a wider bike lane, a wider travel lane, that's a design decision that you make as a community. Another section of the same road, and to tell you why this is so problematic, because of the signals, this road at this location backs up six hours a day for a mile and a quarter in all directions. The solution that engineers are allowed to do if they do it on their own, is to blow this into five lanes. But if they did that, they need $300 million just to buy the real estate. Another solution, if they can't afford the real estate, is do a $70 million flyover 
and that would destroy the land value. But by working with land use folks, we can come up with a totally different solution that will look like this. It takes out the signals, which are not the most efficient intersection, and replaces all signals with roundabouts, which move 30% more traffic and eliminate delay. And they're 90% safer. And they're more beautiful, and they add value to the land. What's not to like about the roundabout, other than when you go into it, you're being required to think. <laughs> and I've had people tell me I don't like roundabouts because I have to think before I go into an intersection. <laughs> Folks, that's a very good thing to do before you go into any intersection. Uh, but here's the conundrum. This road, which used to go straight across, was brought in like this. That was an improvement, actually. But do you see all of this, which is a confluence, now creates that congestion. So one of the tasks is always to look at getting rid of a confluence. And in this case, we do it by building a village. And the village now becomes the place, which means people might not even go any further to get what they need. And now, taking out all the signals, uh, now we have many ways to circulate. And we go from a backup in traffic six hours a day to only 20 minutes a day. And that's pretty darn good. And we've added huge value to the land. Another one of my favorite projects is this one. It's in uh, San Diego. And I'll put in a slight pitch for the next new partners for Smart Growth, which will be in San Diego, uh, that we're going to do a three-day guided tour ahead of time. And I'll show you this project, among many others, that we're building down there. So this is a five-lane road carrying 23,000 cars. and. Uh, speeding 40, even 50 miles an hour. And uh, so we converted the five lanes down to two. Show you another section. Five lanes down to two. Now we've created place. Now we've created lower speeds, 20, 25 miles an hour maybe. And at the intersection, 15 or 20. And here's the point. People driving along and through the corridor are getting home sooner at a much lower speed. And now the retail life has increased dramatically. And stores are making money, uh, good money. And uh, new druggists are moving in, new coffee houses. The social life has picked up. Bicyclists used to have to cross 76 feet. Now they cross 14. And, uh, and the motors are incredibly polite. Uh, uh, people now can walk, they can bike, they can drive, and so on and so forth. This is a town I was in just a few weeks ago. It's in Arkansas, El Dorado. And uh, I think uh, anyone can realize their gateway is a total mess. But as a result of our workshop, people came together and are now going to build a brand new gateway nine miles long. Uh, uh, because they believe now that they can have a really great gateway into their town. And this is uh, what I see everywhere. Uh, I know this is a tour in geography. This is Victoria. Uh, they used to have an old alley system that nobody made any money with. And they decided their alleys were an asset, a treasure. And this is what that same alley looks like today. They now make an extra 20, maybe even 30 percent in retail life with the alleyways. Uh, they're, they're delightful places for people now to travel through and so on. Jane Jacobs, uh, I think, uh, identified a wonderful uh, quality to what cities are, but also point us out, don't blame the car. Blame our willingness to come together and understand the complexities of cities and the importance of streets for all uses, not one use. So I'm going to stretch our minds a little bit. Uh, can you all pretend it's the 1400s? Can you do that with me? OK. Uh, and somehow you've all been to high school. I don't think they had high school back then. But is this a correct view of our solar system living in the 1400s? Sure. This was before Galileo and Copernicus, right? Uh, 
Everything centers around the Earth. Is that right? Yeah. But along comes Copernicus and Galileo and said that can't be mathematically. This is the only way the universe could work. And they were led through the torture chambers, told to straighten up their act or to leave the planet. And they straightened up their act. But today we know they were right. I'm going to propose something equally preposterous. What if this is not true? What if it's not true? What if the future economy is going to rest on a people-centered universe? And I think what we'll find out is we'll not only have good health, we'll have good social lives, we'll have good cities, and good economy. So that's my main message. If you plan your cities for cars, you get cars and traffic and virtually anything else you can't afford. Or you can plan your cities for people and places and now you've got money and health and things are the right order, they're the right scale, the right complexity. So having less of one thing requires us to have more of something else. It's a fairly simple message. But this lower picture is harder to produce because we haven't thought about it and now we have to think about it so that's what I'd like to do but I also want to empower everyone in this room that you're the right people to do it who are the designers and who built Key West the answer is right here pirates on average, how many years of design school did the pirate go to? <laughs> and here's the point. The 20% of the landmass of Key West, which they were in charge of, makes 80% of the money today. And if we look at the other 80% of the landmass, the streets don't drink. The seawall's not being maintained. What do you do when you get off of this bus best bet, swing to Cuba. And what in the world does this arrow mean anyway? <laughs> and here's my point. Anytime anyone in planning or engineering or any other profession says we have standards and we have to stick inside that box we created in a different era, they're being stupid. From here on out, we need to think about being a pirate, or at least thinking as broadly as the pirates did. And uh, then we can have a new success. So right now, we're tasking our engineers to only think of one thing, and that's levels of service. How fast can we get the motors to the destination? How little delay can we avoid? And if we only measure that, we're going to fail. But what if we measure something else? We need a new beaker. What would I put in that beaker? I would put this in. How many people get married on a bicycle? In Vancouver, uh, in one weekend I photographed three different weddings taking place by bicycle. Uh, that's a good measure. Uh, how many people get married on a street that got rebuilt? And bring the whole wedding party there. This is a rebuilt street in San Francisco that used to be a freeway. And now people are so proud of it, uh, we're seeing people going there for their weddings. And I think it's important to understand that where people go for weddings to be photographed are good places. Uh, so we, we look at that. Uh, do we see parents walking with their children rather than driving them in a car, or people out jogging with their friends and staying healthy and fit? Or do people roll into your town on a motorcycle, look for shade, and then uh, communicate with the world? Or do they read to their child because you've given them the ease of access to great parks and good things and all of these things? If this is what we believe, we'll see it. Marshall McLuhan is right. How many green grocers do you have within walking distance of your house? And there are apps you can get for your cell phones. Uh, one called Walk Score, that if you just touch the button, Wherever you're standing, it will tell you your score, 0 to 100. 
right here, 93. And as your walk score goes up, the value of everyone's home goes up. Or if it goes down, the value of everyone's home goes down. That's what the new CEOs of America are looking for, is walkability, livability, placemaking. They're not looking when they decide to settle into Seattle of how many hours people would be stuck in traffic. They're not looking at that. They're looking at livability and could my employees raise their family here? And that's what you've got is a focus on the qualities of nature, having built this great library and many other tools and assets. So this is really the image of what should be in that beaker to me and then let's not talk about what it's going to cost. Let's talk about the lost opportunity cost if we don't do it. And if we don't do it strategically, uh, putting our money where it's going to give us the biggest benefit uh, to launch. I also like to start with the notion that cities exist for a reason. Now outside of defense, which was an original uh, purpose of a city, they really were the places for trade, exchange, service products and goods, jobs, but also the exchange for our culture, friendship, history, ideas, knowledge, passion. And truly, if we don't create the right environment, it just simply doesn't occur. And more and more, the cities that figure this one out are going to be the places that new jobs come to. Because the new jobs are going to be small employment, and they're not, again, going to be based on how efficient your traffic is, but how well-rounded your streets are to produce the net result of this scene and not this scene. I moved to Port Towns in Washington after working in over 3,000 communities. This is the one that resonated for my wife and I. We love the climate, we love the people, we love the nature, we love all the things there. But this is what I most love, is everywhere I walk, this is a naturally occurring uh, series of events. People just sitting down and chatting, doing something I, I love, lingering. And to me, lingering is another quality. Now, I stayed in a very, very, very fine resort hotel, but they had no place for me to sit in either the lobby or outside. So I knocked down their scores, and I do that every hotel I stay in, and really, we need lingering to be something we celebrate, not something we punish. So these folks, even though they probably paid for the privilege, they're lingering. And this is a good sign. Uh, they come here. And that's what Starbucks realized, that people will pay way too much for coffee <laughs> in order to have a social fabric in their neighborhood. Uh, one year on one of my mobile study tours, I led uh, people through Vancouver. Uh, we had a full day on bikes and I said, just stop every once in a while, everywhere you stop, look in all four directions. You will never be in a location where you will not always see people. That's the ultimate measure. Vancouver has achieved it. Uh, we just closed out our last farmer's market in Port Townsend last weekend when I was there. Uh, this is a naturally occurring event. Your market square, which is one of the, the tasks you'll work on, is probably one of the most important ingredients you can put in your community. And uh, so now let's talk about streets. Does everybody see the one remaining pedestrian in Missoula, Montana? <laughs> Used to live there for 10 years. Went back three days later, she was still stuck there. <laughs> now the lower picture, is uh, Marine Drive in Dundarave, British Columbia. The two streets perform the same function. By functional classification, they're the same. One is uglier, one is more beautiful. One moves less traffic, one moves more traffic. One is less safe, one is more safe. One raises blood pressure, one lowers blood pressure. One makes far more money and that's this street. Indeed, uh, a strip will only produce five to fifteen dollars American uh, per square foot, where an urban farm, twenty-five to sixty-five dollars per square foot. You can't afford to have strip anymore. It doesn't produce enough. 
And not only does it not produce enough money, it doesn't produce enough social life. And uh, so go for beauty. And with beauty and quality in design, you end up with good economics. So this is a really worthwhile book to uh, order. You can get it from Amazon.com, produced by the Michigan Municipal League. And uh, I uh, love the, the writers. I got to share the space with the top economists in America. And uh, it really does point out the value of building communities for place. So let's talk about uh, Colin, I'm sorry about the misspelling, uh, Collingwood as uh, place. And now I think we'll give a different frame, a different focus <coughs> to the rest of my presentation once we get that element together. So here's the grade card that uh, happens to go along with loss of wellness, loss of human health, loss of uh, a thriving economies is we've lost uh, so much of our place making. So I'm going to use this as an example. This is Cleveland, Ohio. Um, still referred to as the mistake on the lake. And um, this everybody can see there's really nothing here uh, to be proud of. And yet this is the nexus of the whole neighborhood. So I'm going to fly you across the continent to Monterey, California, where they took the same opportunity. Notice the curb line. And by doing this, they got three or four nice little stores to come back to life. And this place is active from 6 in the morning to about 11 at night every day. And this has added value to all homes within walking distance. A quarter mile radius. Now think about that. You do have to make a small public investment in a little pocket neighborhood. And now you've increased the value of everyone's home. Uh, anywhere within walking distance. So I think it's important to point out that uh, not only was Jane Jacobs right, but she paid all the principals 50 years ago almost to the day. And it's all based on the human need, being a biped, uh, that uh, we cognitively realize one day we'll be able to not have to hold on to something this is a week before my grandson, Jack, finally could walk on his own. And it's the last thing anyone wants to give up. You know, whether we have an assistance device or, or someone helping us, we do not want to give up walking. So why have we made it the most unnatural of all acts? And how do we get it back? And in order to get it back, let's remember that you cannot write any prescription for human health that's any better than daily walking. Bicycling, yeah, that's good. But walking is the core, and we need both. So I'll take you to a few cities. This is Portland. Keep in mind, Portland is cold. It's rain. I'm told they have two days of sunshine a year. Uh, but yet, they have very high percentages of people walking and biking. In fact, this bridge, as an example, uh, has far more people walking or biking across it than they have cars. And they made the allocation appropriate. They have one lane for moving cars in a direction. And they have almost an equal amount of space for people who are walking and bicycling. So that's what they value, and that's what they got. They take a two-lane, one-way street and knock it down to a single lane. Because it's the right thing to do. Because you have no other use for that second lane. And then when you get up to the intersection, you have a use for a second lane for right-turning vehicles. And so they add it back in, but they do it in a way that you're not going to get speed. Or in another road, they, they have a different set of needs or issues, and so you can see they're using sharrows. And motors now get the message clear that if there's a sharrow, you do not pass a cyclist until you have uh, a way to go around in a different lane. On a brand new street, they accommodate transit. Uh, obviously, uh, two travel lanes, uh, one is shared access to parking on both sides of the street, that's very important, and then the bike lane, and they get the right width, but they kept the travel lane, and I'm having to use uh, the uh, English equivalent, sorry about that, uh, uh, nine foot lanes, because that's all it would fit. They got their values right. They want parking, they want bikes, they want transit, and they have very wide silos, by the way, which are behind them. Now, let's take a, a typical 
a rebuild. This is a, a school in Wyoming. And uh, I'm all for removing center lines when we don't need them. You have a lot of streets with center lines, but they're absolutely useless. They don't even meet the minimum requirement for a center line. And you're like everyone else. They just got put in. And once they get put in, people think of the road as a higher function or category, and they're supposed to drive faster. So what if we took out the center lines here? And what if we want more people to walk and a bicycle? We do this. We put in very broad edge stripes. We create bike lanes. Uh, in this case, uh, we actually have more of the, than uh, the we need. Uh, we put in a good crossing. And in this case, uh, we get the speeds to come down and people on the sidewalk are now feel more comfortable. There are 22 benefits of bike lanes. Only two are for the bicyclists. We should be begging for bike lanes even if we never expected a single bicyclist in our town. It's just good design. And uh, so I want to celebrate Collingwood. It's just the most amazing uh, discovery very far north in my first time here. The investments that you're making, like this library are phenomenal. And they should be celebrated, not hidden. You should be very proud of your achievements, that you're building for a future, that you're building the infrastructure, that you're looking out for the needs of people, you're putting things in the right location, uh, the whole heritage district, the way you're honoring the waterfront. But you've also got problems. Uh, this was one that was pointed out to us. Uh, and, and just because in early years, too much curvature was put in this trail. Uh, the, as we would predict, the cyclists will go across the tangent in order just to keep going. Uh, and this creates a problem for people walking. And this is something you'll know to correct. Uh, it's a pretty simple to do. When I worked in Audubon Park in New Orleans, uh, which the uh, 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 historic uh, Olmstead brothers had worked on, uh, I made it to where you could first walk, it used to be a carriageway, and then you, as we got bicycling, you could bicycle, and now you can use skateboards and so on, but we had to think through the dimensions and the approach and the etiquette for every step. And that's what you'll end up doing for all of your trails, is to figure out how to organically grow them into something that is safer, works for all users, and not to the detriment of anyone who wants to travel. You'll come up with programs where, where uh, people will learn the skills they need. Life skills, I like to say, active transportation, because it will be taught. And that you will leave behind streets that, uh, again, were designed for one purpose, primarily, uh, to where they're working for all people all the time, and not just some of the people uh, all the time. And uh, so I was very delighted to see the many, many steps that you are taking but to now be able to share with you some of the things other people are doing. So let's start with the bike lanes. One of the things I recommended to your engineering folks is for bike lane lines in your urban areas and near urban, greatly increase the width of the line. And that gives a very different feeling to the motorist. You want the motorist to reach what we call the target speed. We set the speed by design. So if we want 50 kilometers on one road, uh, then we know what features to put in to get people to drive exactly 50. If we instead want 30 kilometers per hour, then we know what to put in to get 30. And if we aren't hitting our target, then we're not very good designers. So we should be focused on these features. But notice here, we purposely kept the lanes narrow. We made the bike lane a little wider in order to do that because we need a place for cars to pull into to let the emergency responders by. So everything was very meticulous, very thought through. And on this one, we set our target speed and we hit it right through the goal, goal post. We really did. This one, we got down to nine feet. Brand new road, rebuilt. Again, notice the wider lane lines, edge lines. And the fact that, yes, the biggest vehicles fit nicely inside of even a nine foot line. Now, I'm not recommending nine. I'm just sharing with you that when we do it, we can still justify it because we're trying to come up with a 
set of complexes. On this road, it's one lane, one direction. It's only meant to be access to farms, but it's also an important recreational route. And so we created a special lane for biking and then allow the motors to drive at 20, uh, well, 30 kilometers per hour. Uh, and they know that, and that's what they travel. So again, as we uh, travel, uh, this case with Brian, uh, we went out to Sunset Point and were able to see that we got a real serious problem getting children from the play area to the restrooms and so on and so forth. Uh, this can now be narrowed down to a much lower uh, travel way, have more angled parking, and now very easy crossings to make. So that's what the engineers do. They figure out what's the problem I'm supposed to solve, and once we re-gear and say the problem now is how do we get more people walking and biking and safe safety for people getting places, then we'll take all of these needs and fabricate them in a way that makes a lot of sense. We've got uh, some really good urban farm uh, around us, in this case a village uh, out uh, by Blue Mountain where I was able to stay. Uh, in this case a total pedestrian realm. But really good, well thought through design. And now, I don't want to call that the competition. That's the magnet that further draws people here. And now it's time for the community to respond with equally thoughtful design. So I'd like to use a couple of examples. Now, one of the secrets of Vancouver is they took the entire perimeter of the peninsula and made it for people first. Their budget is set that way. People first. If there's any money left over for the car, we'll put some in. But people come first, bikes, freight, and then finally cars. That's what they value, and that's what they're getting. So they dedicated the first 50 feet of right away for public access. And then they very thoughtfully, very carefully spaced the buildings so that the buildings behind them would also have views. They maximized the profit and the value of land. And they also set a maximum height that the buildings could be next to the trail, four stories, more typically three. Uh, but then the towers emerge behind the building, but this creates the right scale for people on a trail. Uh, so we celebrate where we are uh, and through the art, through the culture, and then we build and, and so on. So I want to share with you just a couple of things I noticed on, on, a, on a walk when we were talking. First of all, this is an incredible opportunity. You're already doing the right thing by having double front stores, but the parking lot could be further activated. So I'm going to take you to Northville, uh, which is in Michigan. And what I'll say is an alley that's done well is the B Street, so that your principal road here in Ontario is, is your A Street. But the alley is just as important. And so look what they've done here. Very carefully, very tastefully uh, built the buildings to watch over the alley. Uh, they created greens and parkways uh, back through the alleys. Hid all of the utility infrastructure that needs to be there. And uh, created these little courts and plazas. Uh, eyes again up and down the tangent of the street. And created on purpose by design, very low speed travel, only to access the park, not for speed, and, uh, and they achieved it. Uh, this is one of the best, what I call B streets, I've found anywhere in North America. There are others, but this one was so easy, and it's just a small town that did all of these very, very, very tasteful things, so that's an opportunity that's just waiting for you. Now this is what uh, truly offends me, is we did all the right geometrics, the right thought went into it, but then we failed to have the motorist be courteous to pedestrians. And I tried crossing five times just to see if I could get a motorist to yield, and I could not. Uh, so that tells me you've got a problem. Uh, you're leading the customer into a trap. That's what our attorneys will, will say. You, you brought them to a place, but now you're not helping them get across. So we'll talk a little bit about crossing. Uh, we looked at some of your alleys on the far side. This is waiting opportunity for more parking, a better deck, and again, double front stores. Uh, this is the great opportunity you have for your entire market uh, square. Uh, 
have all the orientations and so on. You've got great homes watching over. You've got groceries nearby. Uh, but I also look at what, why are people here in the street and not on the sidewalk. And every time we see a behavior, we should try to figure out why people are doing something that we didn't want them to do and then design to make it easy. So this is your canvas and it's your opportunity. Um, another canvas, how do we get people across the street in either of these two locations? And we'll be looking at the tools. Now let me switch gears just a little bit to talk about economics and why a gateway is so important to you. The uh, heaviest walk area in the world is uh, the Romulus in Barcelona. For 2,000 years, they had the right design. The lower picture only has to carry 8,000 cars, and it's seven lanes. It's a gateway to Spartanburg. True story, uh, a uh, foundation director had flown in by a private jet, was being brought in by a chauffeur, and about the fourth mile of this, tapped on the shoulder of the driver and said, turn around and go back. A university that lives in a city this ugly does not deserve our money. He was about to write a check for eight figures to that university. He never got it. Your gateway into your community has to be the great approach. Um, walls, uh, perhaps what might have inspired the uh, uh, urban design manual. Uh, but you can't have any more of this. You can't have any more ugly streets. They don't fit. You, uh, you are a place that should be of pride. So let's look at why walls are bad. Uh, and not just ugly, but bad. Uh, you could probably say on, on your own behalf which side of the street you're not likely to walk on. Am I right about this? Uh, you, you should not build walls. You should build beautiful front porches to streets. The more important the street, the more you want to attract front porches to the street. But if you build the street long, a developer that wants to make money had better build a wall. Your streets come first. Build the street right, and you'll get the buildings to behave. So you, with your urban design manual, you need a street design manual that gives you streets like this. This should be a thoughtful gateway into anyone's community. It happens to be one of the 10 most beautiful cities in the world. It's Fairhope, Alabama. And uh, they're very proud of their town. Uh, this is Walt Disney's town of celebration. And again, notice how thoughtful every element of this street is. Streets in the future, for the most part, and this will vary, but for the most part, streets should be about access, not about mobility. We've overdone that. We now need to focus on access. So we had a great day yesterday, as, as uh, Robert indicated. Uh, you have great staff. You really do. Uh, Ed, Brian, Chris uh, we were very thoughtful when we got out and studied. Uh, same with uh, all of your senior staff with recreation, parks, and so on. Now, I want to not gloss over this because we have a very mixed audience here. Historically, what Collingwood was built as was very well connected and gridded like you see on the right. There are only a few portions that have ended up like on the left where most towns, and in fact in the United States, 80% of the built America is now what's on the left. And it's, it's not going to compete. And that forces us into the trips. All our trips have to be external. And um, so we, we'll make the connections and so on, but we're all going to go back to the internal trips if we want cities not to survive, but to thrive. And so I think you can just see from yourself in the air that one it is a form where people do naturally want to walk, make investments and so on, the other not. But if it doesn't make all the sense in the world from the air, and then we go to grade, and now it makes all the sense in the world, Five to fifteen dollars per square foot on the left, twenty-five to sixty-five dollars per square foot on the right. Walkable, not walkable. So we go from something like this in the sprawl repair manual, a brand new guide, and with the right imagination, we create meaningful places, places that will endure 
places that are very pure in spirit and heart, and now bring forth investments where we want them. And uh, so I'm just going to show you a couple quick tricks. Uh, notice the sprawl pattern behind, right, the strip. Now with liner buildings. This is in Kingston, the ferry I took to, to get here. Uh, and all they had to do was build buildings 20 feet deep. And with these buildings 20 feet deep, this is what you're getting. And before when it was no, nothing but an open parking lot, you were getting virtually no walking at all. And so really your urban design manual is going to be your guide of how do you do this. This town used to have five lanes out in front. Their main street is called Lancaster. It's in the Antelope Valley of California. Again, this is a Harley Davidson dealership, um, but it's only 20 feet deep. But it's in the right location. So all of the principles that are, are in your guide or in manual are, are really, uh, really just celebrating these details. You need the street connectivity. You need the block pattern. And you need the mix of uses so people don't have to drive long distance. And, uh, and truly, that's all what I found so compelling uh, in your manual. But we also have to put everything in the right place. I was working one evening in a town that uh, was not. They put people with disabilities here. They had put their uh, people for multifamily here. And they had put their seniors here. And that night, they were to make a decision to put their new town hall here. <laughs> All this builds traffic. It doesn't build community. In fact, it tears apart community. And so uh, every decision we make that makes the town better, for example, where do you put the next level of retail? Every time you do it better requires more collaboration, more cooperation, more understanding by the entire community if you're together. And uh, so now let me just point out a few of the tools. Uh, to, uh, a term we're using uh, down in the States is complete the streets. Is that a term that is spread up here, that concept? And what that really means is build the streets for what they're supposed to be built for. If it's a his historic or a heritage history, that's the way the street should read. And the speed, everything. So I love to celebrate this street. It's in Ann Arbor. Uh, they had a wonderful delicatessen, uh, and this is the life in the deli all the time. And uh, outside, they're actually expanding their seating areas. But here's the point. They carefully designed this street to be low speed. If you go more than 10 miles per hour or 15 kilometers per hour, you're breaking the rules, and you know it. Uh, but now they get this. So think about uh, the Market Square, for example, what you would want to do with the side street, the parallel street, and again, where you are, how you would design it so that you produce this. That's what your, your goal should be. Indoor markets, if you're going to have any, or outdoor markets. Uh, think of how you'll use trees uh, with your parking to really green up these streets and to really set a nice stage for uh, investment. If you go to a three-lane road, and I'm sure uh, you will, uh, think about how you can make it look like it's not part of the road. Use color. Uh, in uh, Manitou Springs, Colorado, uh, this used to be four lanes. Uh, the stores were not doing well. We took away two of the lanes, put them in the third, and now they're thriving. And it's something about how do you get it to where it feels like you should yield to people crossing the street. Uh, they wanted a roundabout. Uh, they needed one here. But they just didn't have enough space. I, I uh, celebrate ingenuity. They figured out how to do it on their own. Yeah, we'll, we'll build it. But when the big semi comes or the fire service comes, uh, uh, they can go right over it. doesn't matter. And yet all the drivers have learned how to use it correctly. And so that's innovation. And the fire service knows exactly what to do when they're on a the call. Manage these springs. A um, number of places we walk, we talked about edges, how important they are. If you're to walk comfortably, you need to feel a buffer or a separation from the track. Now, you're doing a really good job with the buffers, uh, but you can do more. Uh, and you know exactly where you need to do them. These are all in Lake Oswego, which is part of Portland or nearby. 
But look how beautiful they're moving traffic and giving the pedestrian a sense of enclosure and a buffer <coughs> just by using landscape materials. And it's, it's not a big cost, but it's a very big thought about how do you create that buffer, that separation, so that next to 50,000 cars a day, you feel like you're in your own realm and not in theirs. I'll skip this because I know, uh, how much more time? 10, 10 minutes, oh good, this is perfect. Uh, crossings, uh, this is one of your big issues. How do you make it to where voters do want to behave? Median islands, crossing islands, this is a very simple one. And if you can do three lane roads, and in some cases you will, this is the perfect tool. This keeps motors from trying to use it as a passing lane, which you never want them to do. And it allows the pedestrian to only have to travel, say, four meters at a time. And only have to deal with uh, a, a car in one direction. And find that gap. Uh, it could also be advanced to this concept and in several of our trail applications, this is exactly what we came up with. By the way, I'm going to leave all the images behind so you'll have all the illustrative work. Um, and it's being videotaped. Which means I probably had to get closer to the microphone, Robert, so I'll get over here again. Uh, but the uh, little oasis, crossing oasis we call it, is really a, a matter of just bulging out the road a little bit, still keeping the bike lanes, and now only having to cross one way, and then the pedestrian or trail rider uh, will go the correct direction and look straight at the driver. Uh, just really thoughtful, really good design. And uh, typically we'll put in lane rails so that you uh, are encouraged to wait and yield. I got in a second time, let me skip that. You can see, again, you can just do it with a 45 degree bend if you're space constrained. Uh, that'll do the same thing, it just doesn't give you as much storage area. Uh, now we can use some visual tricks as well. So notice that this looks pretty uh, narrow, doesn't it? Am I right? It looks fairly narrow? Those lanes are 13 feet wide. And here's the trick. You widen the gutter fans. So visually, to the motors, they think they only are getting 8 feet. But they're actually getting 13. So they slow down. You do that with your cross. Uh, definitely go to the very high emphasis markings. You're doing this really well on a number of the streets I looked at, but uh, your uh, brick colored treatments cannot be seen by motors uh, under a number of lighting conditions. So use the higher emphasis markings. Uh, and, uh, and again, you're doing some really good stuff, very classic. Uh, this happens to be in Madison. The wider you make them, the more visible they become, of course. And in this case, you're using some contrast that's really helpful when you get a lot of gray days. It really pops out the light. Uh, this may not be in anyone's manual, but it's very visible. If that's the goal, uh, you may want to think of some additions. So this is the way I feel your crossing downtown should read. Something like this. Uh, this happens to be in Plymouth, Michigan. And again, I get a 100% yield rate. If I even come near the crossing, the motors are pausing to let me across the street. And that's what I would love to see in your downtown. And again, notice how simple it is. It's very tasteful, it's very aesthetic, it's lit day and night. Let's talk a little bit about terminating vistas because this is another opportunity you have with the waterfront and uh, you're doing some of the right things, but I think you can do more. What's the uh, first thing any engineer learns uh, in uh, traffic engineer or transportation engineer learns? about uh, building a street. And there are three of these. All three begin with a D. Drainage. Drainage. Distance. What's the second one? Distance. No, the second one has to be <coughs> drainage. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the third one? <laughs> drainage, yeah. But all engineers now need to learn uh, the value and the importance of a terminating vista and guiding the eye up to the vista in this case, trees, where to put the sidewalks, how to create the edges, the buffers, all of these things. So one day I was driving down Marine Drive in Dunderay, and out of the corner of my eye I saw this, and then spent the next 20 minutes looking for a parking space. And when I got down to the water, this was my treat. 
uh, to see this amazing thing, the, the parent trying to get the kids not to notice and losing the battle. <laughs> and 20 minutes later, being able to head on out. But the point is, once I was drawn into this, and I was already parked anyway, I spent $1,000 uh, in Dunderay on camera lenses. Now, I needed the camera lenses anyway, but they drew me in. And that's what your downtown needs. Enough visual treats, enough emphasis, enough quality to the streets that walking becomes natural, that biking becomes easy, and, that, uh, uh, and the question comes up is, which is better, bike lanes or trails? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Both. Um, there will be times when I, as a person wanting to make some time and distance, want that lane and need it. And other times I want to be there with my family and I don't need the lane, I need the trail. This is the lean rail, uh, very, very helpful uh, to get people to yield and to stop. Put these here, put them in the medians, put them everywhere. A little bit on uh, uh, wayfinding. And one of the challenges I think Robert and I will, will give you is, what can you do in 100 days? Make that commitment today in the workshop, and within 100 days have something that you can act on. Uh, London has one of the best wayfinding systems in the world. They thought it through very carefully, uh, but so do some very rural, rustic areas. And, and whoever you are, whatever you are, come up with the wayfinding emblems and symbols. And I want to just close out. I still have two minutes left. Five. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and show you what one development family can do. This is in Buena Vista. It's 9,000 foot altitude in Colorado. Uh, the family that wanted to build this community of, I believe it's going to be 700 rooftops uh, at the headwaters of the Arkansas River. They're kayakers. So they want a town that taps into their resource, their asset, exactly what you want. And so this is what they've done. They've come up with the, with the credo, one might say, or the, uh, of the purpose of their community. And these are very stealable. Um, they applied for money for their parks, and they now have five parks they're building. Uh, it's a natural place for a child to learn to ride a bike. They knew the importance of getting the public there right away, so the first building they built was their microbrew. <laughs> Pretty smart, I think. And it's always packed. And um, these are the first homes they built. And um, these are their streets. And more of the homes. They found glacial tilt, so they just... They, the developers, got down on their hands and knees and built their first street to, to be very authentic, very low speed, and uh, very proper width for what they wanted to achieve. And this is a town that right now only has 30 homes. And they understand you build the parks first. You focus on the waterfront first. You draw the connectivity together first. And then more and more and more people will come but you get the dimensions right, you make your town the destination, not the pass-through to somebody else's resort. And then you become the great success. Uh, you have the jobs that your children can stay in your town uh, because you've been very thoughtful. Now, I want to close with a couple of stories. Uh, I'm being interviewed here for a 15-minute feature on how to do walking audits. Uh, it's what I've become well-known for. This is the film crew that shot Woodstock. We're all aging gracefully, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I certainly would. Um, uh, this gentleman I'm shaking hands with is Dan Buechner. He purposely picked a town your size, Albert Lee, Minnesota, that had no jobs. They had, their only factory had burned down and decided this was the town where we'd bring back human health and well-being. And with a strategy of the built environment, nutrition, lifestyle, and a few other features, we added, on average, one and a half years of life to everyone in that town. Over 10,000 years of life added with taking simple steps, and this was all done in three years. 
Uh, we're, he's now uh, done this, uh, and we've been on his team for Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, Redondo Beach. Now we're going to do the entire state of Iowa. This is something that should be done in every Canadian city, because you cannot afford for 40% of your monies to go into taking care of people after they've come down with things that should have been prevented. But this is also where you start. I was in Bend, Oregon, and I uh, was watching all the things going on here. Uh, the children noticed they have uh, notepads. They would sit and they'd draw. And then they'd get, go somewhere else and they'd sit and they'd draw. And they're doing this all morning. So I went up to the teacher and said, what are the children learning to do? And she said, well, Dan, these children are learning how to design a city. These will grow up to be great uh, leaders in their community, great taxpayers. They won't fight the things they need. They'll, they'll fight the things they don't need. And uh, this is where we start. And this you could get underway in 100 days. Or uh, in this case, 43 people donated their days to come together to build for Los Angeles, all of Los Angeles, a brand new street design manual. And this is meant to be stolen and adapted in a community. And we're now doing that for the state of Arkansas. But all the right people came together from urban design, from transportation, Federal Highway Administration, the brightest minds in America donated their time because they realized the poignancy, the incense of getting streets right. And I'll, I'll click through these because I just want to close with a couple final points. This street, this town, West Palm Beach, when the mayor started, she only had $3,000 left in the entire city budget. That's all there was. We pulled together a charrette and was able to be part of it. And within six years, this was on the ground. One developer alone brought in $1.3 billion. This is West Palm Beach today. And now there are millions of dollars to pump into the next neighborhood and the next neighborhood and the next neighborhood. You start with your greatest treasure or asset, you make it better, and now you've got money to do the next thing, to be strategic. My friend bought the uh, building on the block on the right and converted her building, working with the city and the property owner across the street from the street that's disappearing to the street that's appearing. She bought this for $150,000 down. Within a year, she was worth $1.5 million. So she bought the next block. And uh, the city helped. They did their part. And now she's worth $3 million. And she then bought the next block. Do you see where I'm going with this? Uh, we invest in the right things. We do the right things. We get the right results. And this is how you build a local economy. So when I'm thinking of your market square, I don't know what it will look like, but I know it will be green. I know it will be inviting. I know that it will be the natural place for entertainment. But that's what we'll ask you to do after the meal is to think through at whichever table you're at what qualities, what assets, what uh, fundamentals that you want. Now, you're not in the position of Crested Buttes. Crested Buttes had virtually no money left over after they paved the roads, uh, which they waited a long time to do, and now had no money, they realized they needed street lamps. And so, having no money, they got on the phone, called around, and finally found out Burbank had a whole graveyard full of old street lamps. So they sent down a semi-tractor trailer, brought them back, and in exchange they gave them t-shirts. <laughs> that was their trade. And then the citizens turned out and remanufactured the street lamps into something beautiful. And as I understand it, your public works department uh, took <laughs> very sad, old, tired, <laughs> leaning uh, street lamps that were welded together multiple times and now have been replaced by some that had that authenticity and color and character. This woman in Raleigh, North Carolina realized that Hillcrest was Hillsborough Street was the most dangerous street in the entire state. She brought us together, we did a charrette and remanufactured the concept for the street and this street now has already attracted $200 million. By taking the most dangerous street and make it the most beautiful, attractive and functional, they're making money as a city. Uh, this gentleman in uh, Rattleboro, no I'm sorry, New Newport, 
uh, realized they needed wayfinding, so he had the uh, the ability to bring people together as a committee. They designed them and built them for seven thousand dollars. All of the wayfinding for their community, and it was all just a matter of people realizing what was missing and starting to work on things. But this is really the image I want to close with. One day I was traveling to uh, Northern California and saw these people building a trail. So I, I went to them and I said, how did you end up building trails? And they said, well, our county road was no longer being maintained and now our postmaster said they wouldn't deliver mail. So we decided to form a small nonprofit group, we did, and we fixed our own road. And once we fell in love with working together, nobody can stop us. And so now, every weekend, they go out and they build trails. Uh, maybe I'll close with this story, because it's equally uh, amazing. The woman standing in the middle, a recent immigrant uh, to uh, uh, the United States from Haiti. Uh, very sadly, a child was killed on the street in front of her house by traffic. She grabbed the tin can with tears in her eyes, walked around the entire neighborhood and collected $2,500, took it to a foundation, they matched it, they're up to $5,000, took it to the city, they matched it, now up to $10,000, then came to me, one of these uh, folks is the city councilor, and we donated $10,000 in services, gave them a master plan, and then this was matched by uh, federal monies, and they have $850,000 to rebuild their streets into livable places. So a street like this in New Haven, uh, Connecticut, will become a street like this. It's all about building for walkability, livability, civility, the proper actions of drivers and so on. So I really want to close my moments with you by saying we are not just in a period of the greatest change for our countries in our lifetime. We are in a paradigm shift. From now on, anything you do that adds to walkability, livability, people will build your economy, it will build your health, and it will build all of the things that all people crave. But hopefully, by working together, it also puts purpose in your lives to the point where we're pretty sure about this, it adds seven years of life to your life. To have a purpose, to be mission driven, and to be able to find others that will go out and do that with you. Thank you very much.